Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, you love us with an everlasting love, and you can turn the shadow of death into the light of a new day. Help us now to wait upon you with believing hearts, that as we hear the words of eternal life, we may have hope and be lifted above our present sorrow into the light and peace of your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We're going to join together as we sing. We're going to sing two hymns this morning. They're in this red hymn book. The first, how firm a foundation, number 660, 660. to invite Martin Groot to come and share some memories of Albert now. And thank you for coming as far as you have to be with us today. Dear family, uh, friends and neighbors of Albert, uh, my name is Martin. I am the brother of the same age, about the same age of Albert. Yes. My brother is deceased, and we all, his nine brothers, 
and sisters are in mourning. We will never more hear his fantastic tales, his problems and his solutions. Ab was a remarkable man. He took his own way all his life. Mostly well done. Sometimes we think, how could you do so, Ab, my, my, my body? How he loves freedom more than everything else. He is born in 1937 in Diemen, a small village near Amsterdam, three years before the World War II. It was a big family. Ab was, Ab was number four of the kids. And that war was marked, has marked him his whole life. German soldiers marched into Amsterdam singing, England is the next enemy to defeat. His father came back home after two months as prisoner of war. And in the last year, he saw the cruelty of the war, the hunting on the Jews as on animals, and the hunting on his father every day for forced labor in Germany. He was guard post on the street and warned his father to hide himself away when German soldiers came. He saw the, in, the hunger of inhabitants. He and the younger brother Jacques tried to get some milk from farmers, for mother and the ba and baby br uh, brother. And he saw the soldiers who confiscated the milk for themselves. In May 1945, Canadian soldiers liberated Amsterdam and he admired them. And this event marked him. Freedom is the highest good above all. It was the standard for him his whole life. But I think too, the memory of these events traumatized him. He always distrusted authorities. Every day, he looked out for the world news and gave us advice when it was heavy in the world. Five days before his death, he warned me about the situation in Ukraine and Russia. He said, they are hunting on Jews. This is the beginning of the Third World War. Martin, come to Canada. Only here it is safe. After his school years, and a little job, 18 years old, he went to sea. A sailor. He thought it is the ultimate form of freedom, the sea. He crossed over all the oceans, from Europe to Australia, from South America to China. He discovered the world and settled after about 10 years in Canada in 1967. He found rest, married, and he was a family man. He got two sons, Albert and Nico. He was proud of them. I think he never said it to them, only to me, Albert and Nico. He trusted you and hoped for both of you a happy future with your families. He praised your reliability and your commitment. He found freedom in Canada but not freedom without rules. In every community, freedom has boundaries. And he, he accepted those boundaries in Canada, but all his life, he wished to throw off that change. Often when I phoned him, he talks about that. It was his war trauma. He was anxious, therefore. He had a cautious nature. Sometimes I think, I think, suspicious. We, his brothers and sisters, understand. I hope nobody feels himself undeserved treated. If you realize the background he lived in his, as a young child, you understand it too. Canada was his finest country, he often told me. He loved this country, but sometimes he was homesick for Holland, for Amsterdam 
you ask me about the harbor, the football club, the Queen's Day, the tulips, you see the tulips here, and so on. And we, as a family, we miss a remarkable brother. Mostly he was, as we say in Dutch, the apple of our parents' eyes. But sometimes the nail of their coffin, say we in Dutch. But always my parents loved him. We are very glad he has lived in this free country. So many years peaceful. Thank you all. <coughs> we thank Canada for this hospitality. At the end, I want to thank everybody who take care for my brother up in his last difficult years of sickness. Especially, I want to mention Valerie Lennon and Max Boekdrucker, Up's friend in good and bad days. Thanks their effort, his last years were, were difficult, but it were happy years for him. Thanks too for both sons and their wives. He was very glad with their help, he told me. They are busy with their family, the job and so on, but they find time for their father. Thank you very much. I wish Valerie, Albert, Angelique, Nico, Rani, and Isabel, and Yvonne the blessings of our God in heaven. You go on with the memories on the man who, on the man who lived his life as full as possible. We, his brothers and sisters, will never forget him, and you all, our family in Canada. Up. Rest in peace. Thank you, Martin. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Habakkuk. I'm reading from chapter 3. Verses 17 to 19. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on to the heights. And our psalm this morning is from Psalm 121. This was a particular favorite of Albert's. I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day nor the Moon by night, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Thanks be to God for his word. Now we're going to have some more personal reflections and I'm going to invite Al first to bring his thoughts. I'd like to thank everybody for coming, um, especially 
families from Holland and families watching in Holland. Thank you very much. It's uh, appreciated everybody's support and understanding in this difficult time. For those who don't know me, I'm Albert's older son. Uh, we share the same first name, Albertus. Both my parents believed we shared many similarities before I was born, and it seems they were correct. While my father and I often had difference of opinions, uh, we were both very stubborn. We could always somehow share a common understanding. This became even more prevalent in later years. While many knew my father as one who was full of life and excitement and always had a joke or a smile, there was far more to this man who grew up during the Second World War. I would like to thank my Uncle Martin for sharing the insights uh, from his childhood and the stories from when he was growing up because it, uh, it puts things in perspective and um, shows where my father came from. And I hope after today, he will be remembered for the many things he has accomplished in his life and the joy and happiness he brought to those around him. My father wore many hats. Many knew him as a problem solver who had a solution to almost anything. While others knew him as a handyman who could fix anything from electrical equipment to mechanical to plumbing to structural. In fact, growing up, I never knew what an electrician or a plumber was or why you needed a carpenter. My father just made it happen. He loved all things technical, even helping us with grade school science projects. And thanks to his assistance, we always did very well. He was also an adventurer. He traveled the world on the ships and saw almost every country and experienced every culture. Quite often, he would meet a person from another culture and be able to say a few words in their language as well as have a short conversation about a local landmark or dish. He was also an entertainer who lived for excitement and always made things exciting. As many can attest to, there was never a dull moment when he was around. He was always the life of the party. While many knew of his above traits and characteristics, many did not know him as a protector who on many occasions came to the, assist the assistance of others in distress. He was never afraid to get involved while others stood idly by. One evening, I recall him telling us a story about how he had returned. He was on his way back to Niagara Falls from uh, Toronto. And at Union Station in Toronto, um, he saw a crowd of people. Being the curious person he was, he went to look and discovered one man on top of another, beating the person senseless. As the crowd stood around looking, my father jumped in without hesitation and pulled the person off, holding him to the ground until security arrived. While this may not be unusual, it is considering that he was in his late 60s or early 70s at the time. On another occasion, he heard screams from a woman's bathroom and entered to find a woman being assaulted. Again, without hesitation, he stopped and restrained the man with a few karate techniques until security arrived. There's also countless other stories where he'd stopped on the side of the road to help somebody with a broken down car or somebody needing assistance. Karate was another part of our lives. He started attending classes, and later my brother and I were also enrolled. We had a Saturday morning tradition, where after class, he would take us for a healthy post-workout snack of chips and pop. This tradition continued for many years. It is because of these early fun times that my brother and I both shared a keen interest in karate. Both as a child and as an adult, I have many fond memories of my father. As a child, I recall him taking me to work one day where he was reviewing plumbing and fire systems in a building. This was long before Bring Your Child to Work Day was introduced. 
It was at this time I began to have an appreciation for engineering, which led me to my present path. On another occasion, he took us to Mossport Racetrack, where he had a friend that was racing cars. As was customary, he removed his CB radio, which was popular at the time, and placed it in the trunk. After the race I concluded, it was time to reinstall it. However, I had seen him do this several times, and had somehow managed to convince him to let his 10-year-old son give it a try. It was only wires. What could possibly go wrong? Against his better judgment, he let me proceed. Within a short amount of time, there was a large volume of smoke in the car, at which time he started disconnecting the wires rapidly, trying to extinguish the flames. After a few harsh words, he forgave me, and we drove away. For some strange reason, I was never allowed to install the radio again. My father loved his birthplace of the Netherlands and always missed his family. He would return as often as he could. While he left a long time ago, the Netherlands never left him. We were always surrounded with something Dutch at home, whether it was Dutch shoes, painting of windmills, Dutch food, such as Dutch cheese and licorice. And every Christmas, he would bring Dutch Christmas bread, and everyone would get a chocolate alphabet letter corresponding to the letter of their first name. The World Cup was also another reason to celebrate orange, especially if the Dutch won. He would be dressed up in the classical Dutch orange, as you've seen some photos, with a shirt or head covering. On our birthdays, he would sing happy birthday to us in Dutch, usually first thing in the morning. A birthday was never complete until we received our birthday song. In his later years, my father became limited in terms of what he could do due to his failing health. However, he never this never stopped him from finding alternative ways. When the doctors told him he could not cut grass anymore, he bought a tractor and still got the job done. When they told him a year and a half ago that he could fly no more, he devised another plan to return to Holland one last time. He was going to board the Queen Mary and sail across the Atlantic Ocean to accomplish his goal. Unfortunately, he was not able to complete this. However, we will comply with his wishes and return him to his home. My father was very strong-minded, kind, supportive, and a fun-loving individual who had a zest for life. He conquered many challenges in his life from early childhood, growing up in the war, to traveling the world on the ships, to immigrating to a new country twice, without knowing any English, to facing challenges as he ascended in his career path, to finally facing his many health issues. While, would, while many would not be able to endure the challenges that he faced, he always faced things head on and fought through, always with a positive attitude and a smile. His health was compromised towards the end of his life but his mind was always intact, and his will to survive was always prevalent. Pa, you will be missed. Life without you will never be the same. Thank you, Al. I want to read these words on behalf of Nick. And Nick says, 42 years ago, I began a lifelong relationship with a man who was resilient in his struggles and who succeeded. Growing up during the war shaped his character, but little did he know how much it would shape all of ours. Albert was a complex man who was always intent on making things work or at least figuring out how they worked. I remember one year he was determined 
to figure out the lottery system. And so he designed spreadsheets after spreadsheets of numbers and numerous data equations. After investing hundreds and hundreds of dollars week after week, he told me one day his system had finally paid off. He had won $10. Smiling ear to ear, he said in that Dutch accent we all love, see, I am no fool. He believed any problems in life could be organized in a spreadsheet and solved by detailed calculations. He was a practical engineer. Albert was also a fighter. He overcame many hurdles and succeeded, but this last fight tested him and he needed help. I know now that he is safe in the merciful hands of our Lord. No more pills to remember or fluid or sodium restrictions. Pa, you have left a big part in each of us your children and grandchildren, we love you and we will never forget you. Thanks, Nick. Now I want to read some selected verses from the New Testament from Paul's letter to the Romans from chapter 8. And in part, he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. We know that in everything God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not give us all things with him? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. About two months ago, I dropped over to Albert's home. Valerie was there. It was in the middle of the Olympics. You remember that? Yeah. The Olympics were going on. That's when it was. And got to hear from him some of those stories that Martin, you referred to. And I just want to say a word to those of you who are watching in online today and uh, to all of those who come from Holland. When I was hearing those stories from World War II, how hard things are, thinking in my mind for those of us who have lived in Canada all our lives, and I've been in here 61 years. Uh, in comparison, we just have never had that kind of difficult experience. So, Albert, I, I told you at the time, but, and to the rest of you, please know you have our respect. You have our respect. I'm thinking I'm saying that for all of us here who call Canada our home. Yeah. Then uh, the other thing I would want to say, the Apostle Paul, in, in his writing in the New Testament, was in First Thessalonians writing some people in a Greek province who had gone through some, some really difficult times, probably not unlike that that Albert and all, all of the people who live in, 
in the Netherlands had experienced in World War II. And these folks in, in this province of Greece ha had lost people close to them, had many, many difficulties. And the apostle wanted to bring a word of encouragement and a word of hope. And so very succinctly, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he says, we grieve, and then he adds a little phrase, but not as those who have no hope. We grieve, but not as those who have no hope. And I think his words are appropriate for us today and particularly as we say goodbye to Al. What the apostle was saying, first of all, was that grief or loss is part of our human condition, part of our human nature and how we handle that how we deal with that that differs from person to person uh, I like to say that God doesn't make two snowflakes alike fortunately he's got rid of them all as spring comes here in Ontario but every single snowflake and we had a lot of them this winter not not two snowflakes are, are identical and not two people are identical either. God's wired us all up a little bit differently, and that means each one of us experiences the loss of Albert from our own unique humanity. Now, there is a Dutch priest. He died a few years ago. He had finished out his ministry in Toronto, working with Jean Vanier at L'Arc, a home for the disabled. His name is Henri Nouwen. And when I was in seminary, that's quite a few years ago, one of his books was on our reading list. It was called The Wounded Healer. And as you can guess from the title, what he was saying was that it, it is out of our own wounds and scars that God works and forms our character and develops us. And now one was trying to give some word of, of uh, instruction on how we can deal with our grief. And he said this, and I quote him, when we honestly ask ourselves, which person in our life mean the most to us, we often find it is those who instead of giving much advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a gentle and a tender hand the friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion who can stay with us in an hour of grief or bereavement and who can tolerate not knowing not curing not healing and face with us the power of our powerlessness. That is the friend who cares. And Valerie, Al, Nick, families, family from Holland, you have friends supporting you. I'm sure people in Holland praying for you right now. And even though they're a long way away, their prayers still hold us up. Those are the friends. Who cares? And one of the way that God wants us to be able to deal with loss is by supporting, caring, encouraging one another. That's a big part of why we come here today. We grieve, the apostle said. And then he added that little extra thought, and he said, but not as those who have no hope not as those who have no hope. And we've already had that referred to in the, in the tributes that we heard and the hope that we have. We just celebrated it uh, here in this church, all churches did at Easter just two weeks ago in the hope of the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus went through on Good Friday the worst that can happen to anyone when he was crucified. But you know the story. 
Three days later, God raised him from the dead and said, I did this once and I can do it again and again and again. And just two weeks ago, here in this church and, and in a lot of other churches, we took a page from our friends in Eastern Europe, from our, our friends in the Orthodox Church, and whenever they would gather on, on, uh, on Easter, as they were walking through the rugged mountains of Eastern Europe, uh, our Orthodox cousins in the faith, one would say to the other, Christ is risen, and the response was always, Christ is risen indeed. And for 2,000 years, people have been making that exclamation that Christ is risen, that he's risen indeed. And what strikes me is that nobody ever says, the dollar is risen, it is risen indeed. Or my RRSP is risen, it is risen indeed. Or General Motors is risen, it is risen indeed. What people say is that Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. And so for today, for now, for Albert, Christ has risen. He's risen indeed. And he's made that same promise. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. I go and I prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I will take you to where I am, that you may be there also. And that promise is true today for Albert. Albert's made a number of journeys in his life, a number of journeys, a big one coming here to Canada, of course, after the war. But there's one more journey, and let me tell you about that one. I want to tell you a story to help us understand. The story comes from the days when riverboats were moving up and down the Mississippi River in the southern United States. And this one day, this uh, old gentleman was fishing on the banks of the river. A young lad came alongside, fished along with him. They didn't know one another, never met one another, but conversation was good between the old man and the young boy. Fishing wasn't so much, but the conversation was. And so they fished all day, they talked all day, they had talked about many things. When dusk came, one of the river boats was seen making its way up the river, and the young boy started waving his arms, waving his arms at the boat. And the old guy on the riverbank says to him, Son, that boat's not going to stop for a young boy like you. Well, sure enough, the boat slowed down. They came close to shore, laid a gangplank from the boat to the shore. The young fella walked across the gangplank onto the boat, turned to the old gentleman on the shoreline and said, Mister, I knew this boat would stop. You see, my father is the captain, and he's taken me to a new home up the river. Well, I want to suggest that that's what happened for Albert. And God, the ultimate captain, has taken him to that new home that Jesus promised. And whether, whether we're living in the Netherlands, whether we're living in Ontario, wherever it may be. That part doesn't really matter. Because God's promise, Jesus' promise, is that there will come a day, there will come a day when we will meet again. I am the resurrection and the life he that believes in me, and I know that Albert believed in him. I heard him say that with my own ears. He that believes in me will never die. And so we entrust him to the everlasting arms. Let's pray. 
Eternal God, you have set us into this vast universe, into the mystery of time. It takes us more swiftly than we know to what we call death. We cannot totally understand, and yet we marvel and wonder. We believe that you created us. You gave us minds to think, hearts to seek. You gave us wills to decide and work to do. We pause this day as we thank you for the life of Albert Groot. We thank you for the goodness and trust in his life that fulfilled your purposes for him, that made our lives richer for his presence. We thank you for love given and love received, for faithful friendship, for all of the graces of soul and character that endeared him to us. Keep tender in our hearts these memories, and as we, as we are grateful for his life that you first gave to us, help us now. Give it back into your hands. And grant us the help of your spirit in the days to come. Especially uphold those who will most keenly feel the pain of this loss. For each one in the family, each friend we pray. Patiently heal their sorrow. Strengthen the love that binds them to one another, and help us all to discern the meaning of our years. Let not the sorrow of death rob us of the joy of life, and whatever light may shine or shadow fall, give us a brave heart and faith to make of everything temporal a path that leads to life eternal. We offer this prayer in Christ's name, and now together we pray as our Lord first taught us to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our concluding hymn, number 238 in the uh, Red Hymn Book, How Great Thou Art, 238.
remain standing, please. I'm going to read until we meet again. It is on the program. Each morning when we awake, we know that you are gone, and no one knows the heartache as we try to carry on. Our hearts still ache with sadness, and many tears still flow. What it meant to lose you, no one will ever know. Our thoughts are always with you, your place no one can fill. In life we loved you dearly, in death we love you still. There will always be a heartache, and often a silent tear, but always a precious memory of the days when you were here. If tears could make a staircase and heartaches make a lane, we'd walk the path to heaven and bring you home again. We hold you close within our hearts, and there you will remain to walk with us throughout our lives until we meet again. Our family chain is broken now, and nothing will be the same. But as God calls us one by one, the chain will link again. And so it will, and so we commend Albert to God's eternal care. We commit each of you to his grace and his mercy. Now may the grace of the risen Lord, the eternal love of God, and the presence and power of his Holy Spirit be with you, rest with you, and remain with you this day and always. Amen.